If you'll keep your place in John chapter 17, that's where we're going to be going. And I want to talk to you today about how you are not on your own. We're never on our own. The Lord is with us. And in this passage, we see that vividly. I remember when my kids were little, um, we would take trips, obviously, here to come home and then head back to where we were living at the time in East Texas. And one particular trip, we were in a minivan. The minivan was old. We always had old cars. We had three little kids at the time, and we had a flat tire. We pulled off on this highway that had very little cell reception, not well-traveled, but there was a reason you took Highway 315. It was the fastest way home. And when you had been in the car for eight hours with three little babies, you took the fastest way home. And so there we are on 315, and wouldn't you know it, our tire goes out. And so there was an oil top road just right off the highway. Now, for your, you, you folks that are not from Texas at all, oil top road means not asphalt. I learned that. It's an oil top road. It means they, they take bubble gum and oil and other kinds of stuff, and they just make a road. I don't know what they put on top of it, but it's not really a road. It's kind of like a bump. And so we pulled off on this oil top road, and uh, we started to change the tire. And I got the tire off, and I got the spare. But something happened in the in-between. Something got stripped. I don't remember. It's been 13 years. If it was the lug nuts, I don't remember if it was the item that you put the tire on. But I do remember this. We were in trouble. That tire was not going to stay on that vehicle. Well, I start getting nervous, as every good dad would do, and then angry, as every man probably would do. And you know what my dear wife did? I'll never forget this. Here I am frustrated. Here I am angry. I look out. I see this little bitty baby boy, Landon, just walking. He was about a year and a half old. He's just enjoying the day, doesn't realize what's going on. I'm thinking, I hope you're this happy at one in the morning when we're still on the side of the road here because we're not going anywhere. We don't have cell reception, so we, we can't call anybody. And, and I didn't know what to do. And my wife gathers the kids together, and she says, Guys, let's pray that the Lord would help us. Now, you would think as a pastor, I would welcome that. But in my sinful flesh, I was like, Pray, you need to get over here and help me with this tire. The Lord ain't going to change it for us. But she was doing the right thing, and she just began to pray right there on the side of the road. And I kid you not. The Lord hears my wife's prayers. Now, he doesn't really hear mine, I don't believe, but he hears my wife's prayers. You want something done, you go to her and say, pray for me. They begin to pray, and, and maybe just minutes later, this truck comes by, sees us on this offshoot oil top road, pulls over. The guy gets out and says, do you need help? Boy, do we ever. I can't get this tire to stay on the vehicle. Now, the providence of God, this man said, you know what? I have a, an auto shop just four miles up the road, and I just changed a tire similar to the one you have, and I actually have the part you need that would get this tire to stay on your vehicle. I'm going to go back to my shop, and I'm going to get that part. And then I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to follow you guys into town, and we're going to get you taken care of. It was just amazing to see God work. You ever had a moment like that in your life where, where the Lord just takes care of you? That was one of those moments in our life. And, and what was so wonderful about it is we had help and we had someone that was going to help us and someone who was going to stay with us. And in the middle of all this chaos of three little babies and being stuck on this back highway with no cell reception in the middle of nowhere, I felt better because we were not on our own. The Lord had sent help. And the good news is, wherever you are and whatever you're dealing with, you are not on your own if you're a child of God. You have this incredible promise that Jesus is for you and Jesus is fighting for you and he's working for you. And that's what I want us to explore and look at today in John 17 as we come to the Lord's Prayer. Now, many people will take the prayer that you often hear cited in the Gospels, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and they call that the Lord's Prayer. That is technically not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord Jesus was teaching that prayer to his disciples to teach them how to pray. 
That is the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17. It is the longest discourse of Jesus praying in any of the Gospels. It is the heart of Christ. We see Christ pouring out himself in prayer. It's the night before his crucifixion. It's the night before his mock trial, his beatings, and his death. And here what we see is Jesus taking time to pray. We learn a lot about him. We learn a lot about his relationship with the Father. But we learn also hope that is given to us. All right, here's what I want to do. I want to just show you how you're not on your own. All right, if you're following along in the handout, I want to show you how Christ teaches us through his prayer how to respond to difficulties. How Christ teaches us through his prayer how we can respond to, get to difficulties. Christ was obviously experiencing difficulties. He was about to go to the cross. He was about to be betrayed. Now, what does he do and what does he teach us? Well, number one, I want you to see that when we're in difficult times, like Christ and his disciples were in the most difficult time, what does Christ teach us as he prays? Well, first of all, I believe the text teaches us, Jesus teaches us how to prepare. He teaches us how to prepare. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus was preparing to go to the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm getting ready for something big in my life, I always prepare, but I prepare in different ways. If I've got a big day ahead of me, my preparation is usually, I need to get a good night's sleep. Or, if I know that it's my last day at something, whether it's vacation or something else, I usually think, well, hey, you know what? I, I want to spend my last day of freedom doing something that I've not done before. I want to live it up to some degree. You know that thing that I always said we'd do or that place I always wanted to go? Well, I want to make sure I do that now. You see, when I'm either getting ready to leave or getting ready for a big day, my preparation involves either sleeping or eating or doing something that I never got to do before or making sure I've got bases covered. Now ask yourself this question. Jesus is about to literally die and then go to the grave. And even though he'll stick around, he's going to be ascending back to heaven. And this is his last moments on earth. What does he do? How does he prepare for what's coming? Well, what's striking to me is that instead of saying, guys, I've got to get some rest because I'm going to the cross tomorrow. Instead of saying, hey, guys, I've got more I've got to teach you. I mean, this is it. Come on, gather around. There's things I just didn't say. Instead of saying, hey, you know, we, we never went over to this area of Jerusalem. Let, let's go over and look at the temple. No, instead, what does he do with his time left on earth? He prays. He prays. Look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, those words in the room with his disciples, those words at their, their last gathering together, when he had spoken those words, then he goes and he lifts up his eyes to heaven. And he begins to pray to the Father. Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. I'm getting ready to die. Now, what this teaches us, I believe, in preparation is this. A, we know what to do in any difficult situation by looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. That was his preparation for the cross. And if that's his preparation for the cross, don't you think logically this should always be our first step of preparation when we face any difficulty in our life? I mean, if the King of Kings, if God Almighty in the flesh, if the Son of God needed to pray in a difficult moment, do you think that we are above our master in any way as his servants? 
I mean, shouldn't this mind be in us that's in Christ Jesus? Shouldn't we look to him and say, our Savior needed to pray? And so in a moment of difficulty, whatever I'm facing, my temptation is going to be to change the tire and get angry and get frustrated, but I need to do what Jesus did. I need to stop and pray. Now, the reason we don't do this is because honestly we think, we think, and I'm including myself in this, we think prayer is, is meaningless at times. I mean, let's be honest. If we've never thought that, then we're not being honest about our relationship with God and our relationship in the world. How many of you will say in honesty right now as I'm preaching this, yes, there have been times that I thought prayer was futile. I thought I needed to get to work, not get on my knees. I thought, you know what? <laughs> There's other things I need to be doing besides praying right now. We've got a real crisis going on in our life. I mean, it's that balance between, you know, pie in the sky and reality. We don't want to be too ridiculous, right? I mean, you know, if the boat's sinking, we do need to pray, but maybe we also need to shovel water out of it. I mean, we've got to balance it, right? There's got to be a balance. But what this teaches us is that the Lord first and foremost and primarily put prayer at the center of his most difficult night. And if he will, we should. So we know what to do. We look at Jesus. We look at what he did. He goes to the Father and he prays. We know where to focus. Let her be. All right, how do we prepare for the difficult times? Well, we know what to do. We know where to focus. What's so interesting to me about the first part of this prayer is what Jesus says. So if you wanted to break this prayer up into an easy outline, you could just break it up into Jesus prays for himself, Jesus prays for his disciples, and then Jesus prays for you and I, his future disciples. I mean, that's a really easy outline of John 17. And some of your Bibles, they've even outlined it that way. They have those little bold captions at the top that says Jesus prays for himself, Jesus prays for those who were with him, his disciples, and then he prays for you and I, all disciples. Now that's a real easy outline, but what do you do with that outline? It's got to be applicable. All scripture is God-breathed, but it's God-breathed so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. And so when we read the Lord's Prayer, we have to ask, now what is this here for? And how does this equip me? And I think it's great that Jesus prayed, but what does that have to do with me? I mean, he's praying. Well, again, we're equipped by looking at Jesus and seeing what he did. Now, in the course of his prayer, the first eight verses, John 17, 1 through 8, he prays that the Lord's will would be done. He knows that he's going to the cross, and notice what he says, the time has come, verse 1, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. In other words, Father, complete the work that you sent me to do. I'm not done yet. I've done a lot of great things, but I'm not done yet. I've got to go die. I've got to be resurrected. I've got to ascend to the right hand of the Father. But then he just begins to recount a lot of things. And this is what struck me the most as I studied this prayer over the course of this week. A lot of this prayer is Jesus just talking back to his Father. So there's an intimacy. There's a relationship. And so if you noticed, like verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. I mean, that's a statement. That's not a request. He says things like that over and over. Verse 8, for I've given them the words that you gave me, and they've received them. See, that's a statement, not a request. Now, I, I used to get mad at people, confession, when they would preach when they prayed. You ever know people that do that? Like, they don't pray, Father, help us, Father, be with us. They, like, start giving you a sermon in their prayers. Now, I've known people like that. I've known people like that. Dear, wonderful people that would preach to the people they were praying to. Now, I want to tell you, that's what Jesus is doing right here. See, I'm wrong. I would get frustrated. That's what Jesus was doing right here. He was literally recounting the promises of God. He was saying, I've done this, and you have been faithful. And if you read the whole text, he is recounting 
the plan and the purpose and the promise that God sent him to accomplish. So we know where to focus when we look at the prayer of Jesus. Where do we focus? We focus on the promises of God. That's what he's doing to prepare himself for what's next. I mean, you just go and you see it. Father, glorify me in your own presence. I've manifested your name, verse 6, to the people you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. You gave them to me. They've kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. I mean, he's just recounting the promises and the plan and the purpose of his heavenly Father who sent him to earth. Let her see. We know who is in control. You see, when we look at the, the prayer of Jesus and we say, okay, how does this equip me in the Word to face difficulties in my life? Well, when we look at Christ in His prayer, we see His preparation. He knew what to pray. He knew what to do, pray. He knew where to focus the promises of God in His prayer, and He knew who was in control. He knew who was in control, and that's providence. The providence of God. Christ prepared by prayer, by promises, and by providence. And you see that in what he is praying in verses 1 through 8. Verse 7, now they know that everything that you've given me is from you. In other words, Father, you always had a plan. You always were in control. You are a God of providence. This was your will. I've given them, verse 8, the words you gave me. They received them, and they've come to know the truth, that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. You see, he's recounting who is in control in the most difficult night of his life. Now, what does this teach us? It teaches us how how to prepare for difficulties when we look at Jesus. How do you prepare? How do you prepare for difficulties in your life? Do you model it after your Savior and say, okay, he needed prayer, I need prayer. He needed to remind himself of the promises of God, I need to remind myself of the promises of God. He needed to remind himself that the Lord had a purpose and a plan in all of it, even the cross. I need to remind myself God has a purpose and a plan no matter what I'm dealing with. So how do you prepare for difficulties? Well, Jesus teaches us, you're not on your own. He's right there with you, and his example guides you. Now, let's look at number two. How do we respond to difficulties? When we look at our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, what did he do? Well, he prayed. That was his preparation. But secondly, Jesus shows us his provision. So not only does he show us his preparation, and we can look at that and gain insight, but he also goes a step farther than just observation. He says, I'm actually going to begin to do something for you. I'm going to actually provide grace for you, my disciples, in the midst of difficulty. It's interesting because... Throughout this whole discourse where Christ has been praying and washing feet and eating supper and now going into the garden to pray and all of those sorts of things, what's so interesting is that really the disciples should have been encouraging Jesus. I mean, he was getting ready to go to the cross. And yet the entire time Christ is focused on them, on them. I mean, even as he prays the will of God, the purposes of God in verse 1 through 8, Verse 9, he says, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Man, he is spending those last moments not only praying for his mission, but praying for his ministers, you and I. He's letting us know in my most difficult moment, I'm not only with you, I'm working for you. I'm asking on your behalf. I'm asking. So how does Jesus show us his provision? He asks. I mean, that's the first thing. 
How do we see that Christ is a providing, nurturing, loving, intimate God who cares about us? He asks on our behalf to his heavenly Father. Verse 9, I'm praying for them. Now, the them there were the disciples who were with him, who were present. But notice that he's not just praying for them, the disciples who were there. He's also praying for you and I. He's praying for you and I. And he says that later. He says, I'm not just praying for my disciples, but I'm praying for all of those people who are yours. I'm not going to be in the world. I'm coming to you, but I'm praying for them. So this prayer is not just for those people there. It's for all of God's people, all of his disciples. And you see that there in verse 9 and 10. Now, Jesus is asking. He's asking. You know, years ago, um, I I was introduced to a uh, a really neat pastor, theologian named Brian Chapel. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but when I was at Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary in our preaching class, we were introduced to a book by Brian Chapel called Christ-Centered Preaching. And it has stood out as probably the most influential preaching book in my entire life. So when I found out in 2002 that Brian Chapel was going to be in Memphis, I went to hear him at Second Presbyterian Church, and I was amazed at his sermon. I mean, it was clear, it was applicable. I'll never forget, I mean, even though that's been over 20 years ago, on a Sunday night, I still remember he preached out of 1 Corinthians 10, and he preached about how no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. And it was just a powerful sermon. And I said that night, I want to study under that guy. I want to learn how to preach in such a clear and simple way in the same manner that that guy does. And so I found out that he was the president of Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, And I applied there for my doctoral work, and I got to sit under him for for many years and in many classes, and it was the joy of, of my learning to be a better preacher. He was gracious enough to say, I'll help you in your interview of your your doctoral thesis, and he was just such a gracious man. He once told a story, though, to us that I want to steal and I want to share to you about John 17. He said during the height of the Operation Iraqi Freedom, President George W. Bush came to St. Louis. And in a hotel ballroom, he gathered about a hundred pastors and theologians and church leaders. And Chapel was one of those who was invited that day to this particular event. And as the war was blossoming and everyone felt the danger of Saddam Hussein and 9-11 was just in the books, The president took questions from these pastors, and the pastors told him things that they were concerned about and offered to pray for him and all the sorts of things that a question and answer session would do and pastors would do at a meeting like this. But Chapel tells it like this. He says, when it was over with, President Bush began to leave, and he stopped. Now, if I remember this story correctly, he stopped, and he came back, And he said to the microphone, to all the pastors present, pastors, I want you to know, I am praying daily for you. Now, that struck everyone there odd. Now, before I go any further, I know you can say, well, he's a politician. We're in a jaded age. Nothing's real. I get it. But just for a moment, let's step out of TikTok and Twitter, okay? And let's just assume he meant it. He comes back to those pastors and he says, I'm praying for you. Chapel said, he's praying for us. We need to be praying for him. I mean, he's the guy that's conducting a war and has all of these troops that are ultimately under his command. And we need to be praying for him, but he's praying for us. And his application was just simply this. It touched us. It touched us that he would take time to say that he was praying for us. Now, when you read that Jesus is praying for you, don't wash over that and say, well, of course he is. It's Jesus. That's what he should do. No, no. Feel the weight of that. 
the creator of the universe, the God of all gods, the Lord Almighty in the flesh, says that he is praying for you. I mean, that's amazing. That's like the president in the midst of a war saying he's praying for you. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. I'm praying for you. Now, do you think that when Jesus asks that he gets what he wants? I would say so, wouldn't you? I mean, I would think that if the eternal Son of God asks something of the Father, that the Father does not say, well, I'll think about that. You know, when we ask, we ask with wrong motives, according to Scripture. So often our motives are wrong, and so we get a no, perhaps, because we, we don't know how we ought to pray. We don't know what we should ask for. We're not that wise. There's no way that my little pea brain, when I ask the God of the universe to do something for me, that I in any way could honestly know the workings of God in history and humanity and the intricacies of everything. I mean, you know, the best illustration of this, and I don't recommend this movie. I saw it before uh, it went off TV, so it didn't have any words on it, right? That's, that's all the 80s kids' excuse. I saw that on TV. And then we go back and watch it with our kids, and we're like, oh, dear God, right? But, um, but Bruce Almighty, you know, he, he, he says, I'm going to answer every prayer with yes. And he does. Best line in the whole movie, I'm on the Krispy Kreme diet, and I lost 100 pounds, says one woman who prayed about it. You know, he asks yes to every prayer, and it messes the world up. You see, that's a good, silly illustration of how we're not smart enough to tell God what to do. No, we ask because he tells us. He's glorified in our asking. But we ask so often with impure motives and with ignorance, and we just have to go and say, I understand that. And so, God, I ask the good news is the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, corrects your prayers. When you pray wrongly, the Holy Spirit realigns those prayers according to Romans 8 and re-corrects, re-corrects, that's not right, corrects, no re on the, on the front, just corrects, your, realigns those prayers. Now, when Jesus prays, do you think he ever prays with the wrong motive? You think he ever prays in the wrong fashion? You think he's ignorant to the will of God? Do you think when he asks, he's not going to get what he asks for? Absolutely he will. Absolutely he will. So what is Jesus asking on your behalf and my behalf? Well, let's just quickly look at verses 11 to 26. And I'm going to summarize these in the outline quickly for you. I want you to see five petitions that Jesus is asking for you when he prayed for you that night and as he advocates for you in front of God the Father at his right hand. I want you to see how Jesus is asking and I want you to see how Jesus is equipping, how he is equipping you. And we're just going to see the equipping power of Jesus in five ways through what he asks for us in prayer. Now, the first thing is verse 11 and 12. I'm no longer in the world. They are in the world. I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I've guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now, verse 13, I'm coming to you. And so what he's praying here, in essence, is this. Give them safety. Keep them in your care. And so one of the first things Jesus is praying, and I'm, I'm just summarizing these, okay? I'm simplifying all these big words in these verses. Jesus is praying for safety. Why? Because there is an evil one. There is an evil one. And he is in the world, and sin is in the world. And Jesus is saying, look, they're going to have to face this. And so I'm praying that you would give them safety in the midst of a crooked and perverse world. Number two, second petition. Jesus is praying for your strength. For your strength. 
Verse 14, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You see there the evil one? You see there the world? Jesus will not pray that you get taken out. He prays that you're given strength to stay in. Often our prayers are, get me out of this, God. Trust me, I've prayed that. Get me out of this, God. And Jesus never says, I'm going to pray that they're taken out of the world and that all of their problems are solved and that there's no tribulation or trial. He says, you're in an evil world. The world hates you. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, this is not your home. The world does not like you. It hates you. Why does it hate you? Because you belong to another master, Christ. And if you're a believer and you stand for Scripture, you will be persecuted. Your own friends will desert you. There will be family members that will turn their back on you, and there will even be people in the church who will not want to associate with you because you are standing on the promises and the principles of God's holy word. And when a Christian comes to me and says, well, why am I being treated this way? Listen, Jesus said, you're not above him. If they hated me, they'll hate you. In this world will be many tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. His prayer is that you would have strength, not that you would be taken out, not that you would never face the evil one, not that you would never deal with difficulties and trials, but that you would have the strength to continue. Thirdly, verses 16 and 17, he prays for your growth. Look at verse 16. They're not of the world. I'm not of the world. Sanctify them, verse 17. In the truth, your word is truth. You see, he is praying that you, the believer, not only would have strength, but where does your strength come from? The word of God. To be sanctified means to grow. And every believer is tasked with the promise that the Holy Spirit calls you to grow and enables you to grow. You are not to stay where you are. You are not to be an infant in Christ. You're not to stay on the milk of the Word. There are expectations of growth. And while childhood is cute for a season and it's tolerated, it's not cute forever. Listen, we understand when a mom is in the grocery store and her two-year-old is having a tantrum. We understand because some of us have been there and we know how hard it was and we know that that's what two-year-olds do. But when a 25-year-old has the same tantrum, we don't understand what's wrong with those parents. And in the same way, there are people in the church that are baby Christians and they're going to do baby Christian things. And we expect that. We don't expect them to know everything and do everything just right in the beginning. But what is tragic is there's 40-year-old Christians who have been in the church a long time and they're still acting like they're five years old. And that's how they treat each other. That's how they talk. That's how they walk. And that's, that's an abomination, right? I mean, it's just wrong. It's ugly. It's pathetic. God calls you to grow. You say, well, I've been a Christian a long time. Greater responsibility, you just said. And I spoke that in Yoda. Greater responsibility, you just said. Okay? You have a greater responsibility. And I do too. If we're growing and maturing, then more is on us. More is expected on us. Because Christ prays for your growth. It's not an option. Look at number four. He prays for unity. Unity among his people. You see that unity in verse 21, that they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, the Trinity is one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they operate as one. And God says, if you belong to me and we operate as one, and we are one, then you must be one. And so, Father, I'm praying that as we are one, they are one. What a bad testimony when a church is not united. 
when people are not seeking the unity of the faith. They're not seeking to love one another in unity and let love cover a multitude of sins. What, what a bad testimony that is. You see what he prays here in verse 21? They may be one. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. One of the greatest tools to deflect people away from the gospel is a church that is not unified around truth and a church that is not unified around the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? And they're letting that flow out to one another. Listen, I mean this with the most respect that I can say, but, but it, and I'm not saying there's any disunity here. I would say this at any church that I ever stepped into a pulpit to preach. If you can't get on board with unity at the church in which you are a member, then you need to unite with a church where you can be unified. Because your disunity is destruction. And the Lord is going to hold you accountable for what you have done with his bride. The Lord is going to hold you accountable and me accountable with what we've done with his bride. Unity to be one. And unity doesn't mean that we overlook things and we wink and say, oh, unity is not just let's all get along. Unity is facing problems. Listen, you've got to face problems to have unity. You've got to discuss issues. You've got to go to people. Otherwise, it's a false unity. Real unity is built on loving the other person to the point, I love you enough to speak the truth in love. I love you enough to reconcile with you. I love you enough to talk with you and worship with you and fellowship with you. That's unity. And finally, number five, look at the petition and the prayer for fellowship. You see, he prays for fellowship. The last few verses, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me, that where I am, to see my glory that you've given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Verse 26, he says, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's fellowship that we would have fellowship with God, we would have fellowship with the Father, we would have fellowship with one another. This is what Christ is praying for us. Now let me go back to what I asked at the beginning of this second point. Do you think that Christ gets what he asked for? You better believe it. You think that he knows the will of God in purity? Yes. Do you think that if he is praying this for you, that that is the provision of God and it will come to pass if you're obedient, if you hear it, if you receive it? Yes. Yes. Christ says, this is what I'm asking. And I'm asking that God performs this in your midst. So do you rest in his provision? Now to rest in that provision in difficult moments or in just difficult days Part of it is there is something you have to do. I mean, look, if I pray, Lord, Lord, give us this day our daily bread, I still have to go and work. You know, you, you look in the Bible, Jesus said, pray to the Lord that he would give you your daily bread. And then he says, now, if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. And so in that principle, we're told to pray for things, but we're never told to just sit idly Say, okay, God, manna from heaven. No, you pray, God will provide, but there's something you have to do. You have a part in this. Jesus is praying that these things would be real in your life. And so now what do you need to do? Respond to that. You need to say, okay, God, you're praying this. This is going to be accomplished. I want to be open to it. I want to be obedient to it. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to respond. Do you respond? Now look, no matter what difficulty we are in, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Isn't it good to know that he's standing next to the Father, advocating constantly on our behalf? You see, you are not on your own. You're not on your own. No matter what difficulty you're facing, you know how to prepare and you see his gracious provision. 
Amen? Let's go to the Lord and thank Him for all He's done for us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have not left us alone in this world. We thank You that You never just preach at us. You always provide truth, but then You equip us so that we can be Your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Father, we're thankful for your goodness to us as your children. I pray this morning that the message has had an impact on the lives of these people. I pray first for your children who are your own believers that you prayed for. I pray that they have heard the word of God. I pray that they respond. I pray there's fruit in their life. I pray also for unbelievers that are in the room who have heard that Jesus Christ came to pray for his own and love his own and then went to the cross for his own. And I pray they hear that. I pray that they repent of their dead works. I pray that they hear the salvation that Jesus offers and they come to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing Great is the Faithfulness of God as we close our service. And I just want to ask you to just take a minute, not to walk out the door, but just to respond to God. Just a minute and we'll be done. You can go do everything else in just a minute. But I want to just ask you where you are Just be responsive to the Lord. What has he asked you to do in difficult moments? Are you doing it? Are you preparing and resting in his provision?